Okay, welcome. Uh, today's session is on technology tools and trends and how to make them work for you. I will admit today's session is going to be quite high level um, and we're going to be doing more of a show and tell of what's going on in the technology field today and some of the, uh, the tools that we felt you may enjoy using um, at your organization as well as some uh, ways of thinking about how you may maximize these tools for your organization. My name is Jane. There's a nice little picture of me right there. I'm the Program Director of TechSoup Canada. And uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of TechSoup. Uh, basically, we help nonprofits to use technology to achieve their full potential. Uh, many of you may have um, benefited from our product donations program where we do work with over 25 donor partners uh, to provide about 300 donated products to the nonprofit and charitable sector. Um, in addition to that, we offer additional things like uh, training, uh, for example, the webinar, uh, workshops that we do do in the community. So if you are interested in partnering with us to deliver workshops for your members, uh, please contact us and let us know. Uh, we also have our blog um, where we talk about the latest tools and some of the interesting topics that may be, um, able, may be able to help nonprofits in this field. And every month we do have the Net, Toronto Net Tuesday event uh, where we talk about topics, um, a particular technology topic, and we usually have a nonprofit speaker come in and talk about how they have used that technology within their organization. Okay, so enough about TechSoup Canada. Let's, uh, let's take a little walk down memory lane when it comes to technology. I will admit to you that I've cheated a little bit. Um, I was born in mainland China, so technology was a little bit behind the times uh, where, when I was growing up, so some of you may get a good chuckle out of this, but uh, this was one of the first computers I got to use. Um, it was one of those mainframe computers that essentially when you go into the computer room, the computer is the room. So um, all of the machines are, are along the walls and uh, you don't really have a keyboard to, to um, surf the internet or anything like that. Uh, in order for you to do anything on this computer, you actually have to use punch cards. And uh, at the age of seven, my father uh, used to uh, commission me to basically feed the punch cards into the machine. It was a very manual process, so anytime you uh, needed something to be done, you actually have to go to this particular location. You have to manually, uh, by hand, punch out the cards and feed it in, into the machine one by one. So in, you can imagine how um, angry my father got when, uh, when I tripped one day and dropped all of the cards and he had to redo the whole thing over again. So I probably got the worst spanking of my life that, that day. And then, lo and behold, we brought technology into the household. Um, this was the first uh, personal computer that I owned um, coming to Canada. It was a, the Radio Shack TRS-80. And uh, it was wonderful because uh, it allowed you to be able to use the computer in the comfort of your own home. And, uh, and what's more is you can store the information. You don't need to use a punch card. It's not manual. We had this wonderful thing called a tape cassette to store all of your data. And at that time, it was a big deal because if it, it was able to store four kilobytes, four kilobytes of data. So, uh, you know, right now I think most machines uh, have maybe six gigabytes of memory just on the RAM and something like two gigs of memory um, on your video card. So this was as much as my computer could hold at the time. Uh, of course, my dad got back to me uh, for dropping the uh, punch cards because he, he saw the tape recorder and didn't know what it was for. So he actually used it to tape his, one of his English lessons or something. So he raised uh, all of my programs that I had on there at the time. So afterwards, uh, when computers became more mainstream uh, and, and more powerful, we had the desktop computer. And this was the 3, 3RS80. Um, we owned one very much like it. And I loved it because they had a, a big floppy uh, and a small floppy drive, uh, which meant there was a lot more uh, capability to hold data. And um, I was really happy about being able to buy software locate, you know, on floppies and then install them on the computer. And computers then got more powerful. Um, 
it, this unfortunately was uh, one of those kind of attempts that I had at modding my computer case because that I think by this time I, I became a full-fledged computer geek and uh, but this this was a, a monster machine uh, when you turn it on it sounded like a jet engine was uh, taking off and my husband decided that if I didn't get rid of this computer he wasn't going to marry me um, but computing power is the king here and now this is the machine that sits in the, in your house and it does everything. It, it Your children can play games on it um, at work. You can do a lot more things with software installed on your computer. Uh, you can go on the internet. You have broadband access. And then as you probably can guess, things became more portable. Um, so it wasn't enough to just have a computer in your household anymore a, a, or in your office. Now we wanted to be able to take the computer with us on the go. So if you're at a conference, if you're at a staff meeting, most of us will probably lug our laptops with us because the desktop you can't really bring with you. So technology now begins to travel with us. And then, you know, uh, the phone we used to have uh, landline and then I don't know how many of you remember those bricks of a, of a cell phone that was that was uh, very popular in the 80s and then and then phones became more popular and a lot of people started using them and eventually there was this desire to combine your personal digital assistance with your cell phones and the, the smartphone was born and now on your smartphone you can do a lot more uh, actually pretty much most of what you can do on a laptop these days there's probably an app that can help you to do that on your cell phone provided that you have the latest uh, iPhone or Blackberry or Windows phone or Google phone with the latest apps and a, a very nice data plan of course so what does this all mean I think what it means is that the the way we use technology is changing, but how is it really changing? Well, as I mentioned, we used to have to go to that computer room and, and use a punch card to get the computer to do something for us. So we had to learn the computer language. Uh, we moved that from you know being able to take your iPhones, being able to take your smartphones with you on the road, on the streetcar, uh, outside of the office, into the field. So technology has become more portable. It is now something that we can. It's with us at all times. And what that means too is that we're a lot more connected to technology these days. Um, it used to be I have to use my modem to dial in through my phone line to get on the internet and navigate to the place that I need to go. And then with high-speed inter internet access, it was much faster for me to get that information. Um, but then that wasn't quite enough. So now with 3G um, data plans, you can use your tablet or your cell phone and be able to be connected to the internet no matter where you are on a very portable device. And the convergence piece too, um, as I mentioned, that it used to be a phone is a phone, your TV is a TV, uh, your computer is to do you know, word processing or a particular task. But more and more, that, that line is blending. Um, there are going to be computers, uh, sorry, uh, TVs coming out with Skype embedded in it. So you can uh, use your television set to actually make a Skype phone call. Or um, I don't know how many of you have done this at home or seen your kids do it with, say, your Xbox, which is really supposed to be a game console. You can now surf the internet, check your email, uh, watch a movie or play games on it. So really a game console isn't necessarily a game console anymore. And your computer too. You can play movies, you can watch, uh, sorry, you can watch videos, you can listen to uh, songs. It is more of an entertainment center, but it's also your work machine. It, it, it's, it's now what, what defines a computer to be a computer and a phone to be a phone or a TV. It's blending. So everything is beginning to converge and also they are integrating with each other and allowing you to better use um, one device to, for multiple things. And also two, multiple applications are um, talking a lot better these days. So instead of you storing your information in one database and then having to go somewhere else and uh, manually enter that data somewhere else, uh, more and more what you're seeing are applications that will be able to pass information from one application to another a lot more easily. So all of these things sounds wonderful, right? But what, what we're also seeing too is as more of these things become available to you and supposedly make life easier for you, and we've all heard of these um, 
things that they say, you know, if anything you want, there's an app for that. What that means, too, is there's this pro progress towards abundance and complexity. So in the past, you know, with um, any sort of traditional out-of-the-box software, they may come out with a new version every two years. Now, with uh, things like apps and cloud-based software, um, you'll probably notice that they're changing their functionalities and look and feel every two weeks. And there are a lot more apps you can choose from to do the same thing, whereas before we may have one or two uh, office applications to do your word processing. Uh, with a lot of these new technologies, there are probably a few hundred ways now to do word processing. So for today, I think what we're going to do is look at some of the specific areas. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk to you guys about cloud computing, and then we're going to move on to mobile, and then talk a little bit about CRMs, and that is Constituent Relationship Management Systems, essentially systems that allow you to manage your relationships with your community. And uh, we're going to touch a little bit on uh, about on-demand business intelligence, so ways of looking at your data and analyzing your data to, to give you insights that may be useful for your organization. Also, uh, we're going to skim over a little bit about collaboration software out there and what are some of the things that we should think about when it comes to social media and what are the new trends um, that's emerging in, in that area and also, too, of course, uh, apps, uh, so the emergence of apps. Okay, so cloud computing, um, this is a really, I like to call it as a buzzword, and it's cloud comp computing actually has been around for quite a while. It's just been taken on different terms um, as technology changes. Basically, anything that doesn't sit directly on your desktop or laptop um, is resides or, or in your server, in your office, um, is what we would loosely term it as cloud computing. So these are applications that might be hosted somewhere else. Uh, so a good example of that would be something like salesforce.com. Uh, or if you use Gmail or Google Apps, uh, so that what that means is your Gmail, your email and your uh, documents um, are hosted by Google on their server uh, in the cloud, so to speak. So, you, so the benefits of that, obviously, would be that you don't necessarily have to maintain um, the infrastructure that, that's needed for you to store all this information. Uh, also, you don't necessarily need to worry about the upgrades because here it is the people that are hosting the um, applications for you that they're doing the maintenance and the upgrades for you. Uh, what that also means for a lot of organizations is there's less of a need for that dedicated IT staff within your organization. So if you tr look at traditional ways of how we uh, use applications, it's usually you go and buy a piece of software and you install it on your computer. It needs to be updated. It needs to be upgraded. And someone needs to come in and make sure it's maintained properly. So by going to the cloud, it lowers the cost of IT infrastructure. It also makes things a lot more portable, which means if I'm at home, I don't necessarily have to bring my work computer home. If my application reside in the cloud, all I need is really a web browser. And that gives me a lot more great, greater mobility. Um, a lot of the time, these cloud apps applications have mobile apps that you can use to access the, the application. So I could uh, literally do my work on the streetcar. And having somebody else host your data, having somebody else host all of these, the security aspect of it could also mean that there's more security um, benefits because you don't necessarily have to make sure that your servers are secure anymore. But then there are also the, in the same way that they're good, um, there are also drawbacks as well. So what that means is if you're not in control of your own data, if you're not in control of how the software is being upgraded or what feature is being um, added, then that means you don't necessarily have the control over when the maintenance schedule is going to be. Um, and they may just schedule to have your um, application to go down um, during the time that you actually need to use it. Uh, a lot of these may be free at the beginning, or they will say it's a very low cost, um, $10 a month per person. But uh, because it's hosted, you don't necessarily have control over how many people get to use it, and the fees can change at any given moment. Uh, a good example of this is with Google Apps. Uh, it used to be that for the free account if you sign up, you get 50 users. But um, since the beginning of May, they have changed it to eight users. So what that means is you are kind of at the mercy of whoever's hosting your app. 
also too, as and this is something that I would encourage a lot of organizations to think about in the long term, is it may be a low cost for you at the beginning, uh, but over the long ter longer term, as you grow as an organization, as you need to perhaps scale up, that cost is not going to remain the same. Um, I call it the lease versus own model. So when it comes to cloud computing, you're very much leasing that server space with your hosted uh, provide, um, application provider. You're very much leasing the customer service. You're essentially leasing their infrastructure. Um, so over a period of time, there's a cost to that, even though it may seem to be a very low cost per month for you um, in the short term. So if you are going to be thinking about moving to the cloud, you do want to map out what you need to for the next three to five years and look at what are all of the things that your organization may need and what is the true cost of move, moving to the cloud. Um, Infrastructure-wise, because it doesn't sit on your computer, you will need to make sure that you have proper broadband access, um, that you have the proper secured uh, wireless um, network to make sure that the data that you do transfer is being done properly. So there is that security aspect. Uh, with the privacy, again, because it is not hosted by you, you don't control the privacy, you don't control the security. So I would always say, you know, if you are managing your own server relatively well, the likelihood of a hacker out there hacking the server of a small nonprofit is going to be much lower than their desire to say hack Sony or hack Google. So having your data stored with these large corporations also will draw um, potentially atten attention of hackers, not necessarily for your data, but for all of the data that, are, that they are hosting. So what are some of the popular cloud computing tools? Um, Google Apps, I, I've already mentioned, uh, and most of you may or may not use already. Uh, Salesforce is a, another one. It's a really popular CRM. Box.net and Dropbox are two of the ones that I usually recommend to people for file sharing. Uh, ManyMoon is this new uh, project management software that you can get in the cloud. It works really, really well if you are already using something like Google Apps. And SlyRocket, which is an online presentation software, um, it is available through TechSoup Canada, and it is actually what I'm doing this presentation on. So before I move ahead, I, I do want to, I know I started talking about cloud already, but I do want to take a quick poll with you guys and see um, how many of you are using uh, these new technologies within your organization. So I'm hoping that you guys can actually see the poll. Um, basically, I kind of wanted to know for your work, um, are you using smartphone for work? So not just necessarily answering the phone, but using other aspects of it. Are you using a particular app, perhaps? Um, are you using a CRM? What, or if you're using social media, uh, hosted applications? And it's OK if you're not using any of these things, and, or if you're not sure what these things are. That's kind of what this webinar is about. Okay, and of course, being me, I didn't even launch the uh, the poll properly. So you should probably be able to see the poll um, on your screen right now. So essentially, smartphones, CRNs, social media, cloud, and if you're not sure, it's okay to say not sure. So this is great. What I'm seeing is most of you are using social media. So there's 71% uh, of you said social media. And 43% um, uh, mentioned that they do use smartphones. Uh, about 21% said um, they use CRMs. And 29% uh, mentioned that you guys um, use, sorry, just one second, um, use cloud applications. OK, that's great. OK, so mobile, as many of you know, um, and I do apologize if I'm uh, showing you guys. OK, can everybody see the screen properly? OK, great. 
So I do apologize if we're having slight technical difficulties. Uh, with mobile, it is becoming the fastest growing consumer product in Canada. And uh, this is the data that I've got from 2009 uh, from StatsCan. There are about 22.8 million subscribers of uh, cell phone, mobile phone in Canada. And with the 3G um, and data coverage, um, what they're saying is there's about 99% coverage um, in Canada, so that is probably better than what you would con uh, compare to, say, broadband when it comes to cable or e uh, ADSL. 75% uh, of the Canadians surveyed said they have cell phones in their household. Actually, 50% of the people surveyed said that that is their phone connection, so they don't necessarily have a landline. Um, and they're using their cell phone as their only sort of phone connection. And 21% of them said that they browse the internet. So that's pretty interesting. What that means is, you know, traditionally when we think about technology um, or our presence online, we think about our website. We make the assumption that um, how people are getting to know about our organization, how people are getting to our site, are mostly through a browser uh, that's maybe on a laptop or on a desktop. That's really not the case anymore. Um, more and more people are trying to find out about um, information online through the use of their mobile phones and specifically through the use of smartphones. So if you're not, if you guys haven't really thought about the role of mobile for your organization, I think it's probably critical to uh, start thinking about that going forward. Obviously, the benefits of mobile is, um, as I mentioned, 75% of Canadians have them and 99% uh, coverage within Canada. So it can reach, really, when you think about it, it can reach the most uh, Canadians. So if you're thinking of fundraising ideas or um, ways to get people to give, mobile giving is a trend that's happening more. Um, and because the convergence of technology um, with smartphones, you it is now a camera. It's a video uh, camera, it, you can use it for social media, it allows you to be able to capture a lot of your offline events a lot more quickly. So you can have a volunteer, for example, at one of your events taking pictures, um, blogging about it, and uh, taking a video and uploading it to your site as the event is happening. Uh, never mind uh, streaming, uh, live streaming of, um, of events that you can do online. And things like SMS, which traditionally allow us to just send message to each other. Um, uh, more and more when you see things like group SMS, what that means is it allow you to send instant real-time messaging to large numbers of people. So if you are going to be organizing events uh, where there may be, say, a change of uh, venue the last minute or um, something is happening that you need to notify all of your volunteers very quickly, uh, using something like group SMS is going to be a much faster and more efficient than trying to call them one by one on their phones or try to post the information on your website because people may not be able to get that as readily as they would on their, on their cell phones. So what that means is with the availability of mobile um, phones and smartphones and the applications that people can install on their phones, we're truly shifting from that fixed connectivity of you know connecting through your desktop to um, mobile connectivity. And what this means is as you're designing your site or thinking about your online presence, we should also be thinking about making sure our, uh, we're developing a mobile website or a website that is friendly to smartphones, um, allowing people to be able to browse your site better or interact with you online better. And the drawbacks of that um, are, well, there's a cost to having smartphones for your organization. Not everybody can afford it. And there's a cost to data plans. So what we're seeing, and there's a cost to um, app development. What we're seeing, too, is there's this emerging other layer of digital divide is the people who can afford these kind of digital applications or technologies and the organizations that can't. So you, when you're thinking about your operating budget going forward, it is more crucial to really think about your IT budget um, in, to see if you can actually support the, the smartphones and the data plans or um, application development. And of course, the security is another concern. Um, I recently lost my iPhone, and because I was able to really access a lot of um, information from my phone, um, it was very traumatic. I had to remotely wipe the phone. Um, 
because the, there was so much work-related information that uh, was stored on my cell phone. And it is very much like losing your own computer. So you are as secure as your phone or your computer within your organization. Um, so that is another layer of security that organizations will have to think about. And with mobile tools, um, I will definitely say I'm not really an expert in this area, but if you are looking at getting something like group SMS, there are lots of um, vendors out there that can do that for you. Um, easy texting is one that someone had recommended to me. Um, so you can sort of, this is to give you a sense of how much it would cost for you to say, use it for your organization. Um, so if you need to send out 290 messages to your um, volunteers, it, it will be about $10 a month. Um, and of course, that scales um, as the more messages that you need to send out. Uh, Mobile Giving Foundation Canada is an interesting or organization in that they do um, become that sort of middle person that acts between a charity and a wireless provider. So they help to vet, uh, vet the charity for the wireless provider and um, essentially will connect you to a wireless provider that may be interested in developing a mobile giving campaign. Um, they pass 100% of the donations back to the charity from the wireless carrier. Uh, so I don't really know much more detail be beyond that, but I would encourage you guys to um, look them up. So now I'm going to move really quickly to CRMs. Uh, we just actually had a webinar last month about CRMs and the importance of CRMs. Um, so really it's a, it's a trend to move away from your, um, from your Excel, spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet. It's also a trend from people to move away from siloed databases. So we can still have specialized databases to do certain things and it's perfectly okay to have a volunteer database to store your volunteer information and a donation database to um, store your donation information. But the trend really now is to look at how that data can integrate with each other. So there are CRMs out there that will do just about everything. They will track your volunteers um, information for you. They will also track how you're doing for your programs and services. Um, but uh, the, the key here is to make sure that the data are integrated and the applications are integrated. And benefit of using CRMs, obviously, is to allow you to track your relationships with your funders, your volunteers, your, your members, um, also in your interaction with the public. And what that means is, in the past, when we track our data in silos in our own spreadsheets, we wouldn't know if a volunteer is also donating. We probably wouldn't know if a volunteer is also a member. So how do you ident identify these community champions that have already engaged with you on multiple levels? Um, making sure that all of your um, applications are integrated or having a set of systems uh, that will track everything and be able to produce the data in one area for you or the reporting in one area will allow you to uh, not just identify the champions but also identify certain gaps in programs and services that you might be doing. What's also beneficial about having um, these relationship management systems is they allow you to capture organizational data for reporting. So many of us are probably spending a lot of our time on with funding reports. Um, so what CRMs would do is if you are if you have integrated properly your process within your organization into a CRM, it captures the data as you're going. Uh, through your day-to-day uh, -day operations. So when it comes to time for reporting, all of that information is already there for you and all of that information hopefully is in, in the ready-made report for you. And obviously, to actually make sure these uh, reports are done properly, the cost can be high. Um, and you have to really have buy-in from all levels of organize, the organization. So in order for a CRM to be implemented properly, people have to use it. You can have the best system out there, but if none of your staff understand why you're actually collecting the data or the benefit of collecting that data or what the data could be used for, they're not going to use it. Because if, if it's another step for them or if you haven't integrated well with your existing processes, they're not going to want to use it. It becomes another, yet another thing that's going to take up their time. Um, so here it's really more concentrating on the people and the process uh, and making sure that you have customized the CRMs to integrate 
well with what your uh, organization is actually doing, and that you have spent the time to train your staff, and an ongoing training of your staff, not just the two hours that you get from the developer uh, when they're handing back your CRM. And making sure that you have documented all of the process and ongoing um, things that you need. So the popular CRMs out there, uh, while Apricot and Sumac are two really great ones if you're a small organization, uh, looking to just have something that will track everything for you. Um, so I'm going to quickly, uh, I think, show you well, Apricot. Uh, as you can see, it's it's quite easy when you go into Well Apricot. Um, it ask you to pick a template, a theme, so, so to speak. And then here, you could add on to membership, events, donations, payments. Uh, you can send emails through Wild Africa. So it is an email management system, contact management system, membership management system, donations management system in one. But of course, uh, with any of these all-in-one kind of tools, the downside to that is it's going to be able to track a little bit of everything, but you, if you need a really robust, say, membership management system, this may not be it. Or if you are an, art, an arts organization and you need a, a lot more robust uh, events management system, uh, Wild Apricot will not be it. Um, so, so again, as I mentioned, there's the, the sort of toss-up of do you go with a all-in-one system or do you go with, say, maybe looking at how to integrate your events management system well with your membership management system. Um, Wild Africa does allow you to have a free 30-day trial. So this is basically what I did about five minutes before the session. So as you can see, it is very easy to, to just sign in and get started. Um, and you can manage the page, make edits quite easily. Interface is very intuitive. But if you want something a little more robust, you probably want to look at things like Sugar CRM or CV CRM. Both of these are open source. What that means is you can integrate it. Uh, the code for the, the application is yours to change. So you can change the functionality of the CRMs whenever you want. Um, the cost here isn't in getting the application. The cost is in the customization of the application. So what that requires you to do is have to work with a developer that understands Sugar or CVCRM really, really well, and they will be able to uh, make the customization for you. I will mention that Sugar CRM has two different kinds, the open source one that allow you to install it on your server, but they also have a hosted version, which is very similar to what Salesforce is. Razor's Edge and Convio are the two other ones that I will mention. They're what I would probably call the specialized um, CRMs. So they are good for donations, they're good for um, email management, that kind of thing, but they, they may fall short in some of the other areas. But what's interesting is that these more focused um, applications like Razor's Edge are now integrating quite well with some of the more generalist uh, CRMs like Salesforce. And that goes back to making sure that you have a set of tools that talk to each other. So another thing that I uh, kind of want to talk to you guys quickly about is the emergences, uh, emergence of what we call it on-demand business intelligence. Really, to put it simply, looking at how you're doing um, as an organization. How, so how are your social networks doing? How are your uh, campaigns doing? How are you performing as an organization? And pulling all the data from different areas and allowing you to have that real-time ability to analyze and gain, gaining insight to, um, to what you're doing. So uh, it allows for agile decision making. So you don't necessarily have to wait until the end of the year and run your annual report and say, okay, this year, you know, we spent way too much on uh, marketing or this year we spent not enough on a community engagement um, or we haven't done, um, you know, our social media is falling behind, but we didn't really find out about it until a few months later. So integrating the right set of tools um, and and looking at how the different data could be analyzed and how they would be able to layer on top of each other will allow you to really quickly say, okay, you know, when we sent out that tweet um, in Twitter about this uh, event that we're having, did it actually bring more um, people to the event? Uh, if we have posted a blog about a particular thing, did it raise more awareness for something else that we're doing? 
And a lot of these on-demand um, systems are hosted services. What that means, too, is you don't necessarily have to implement it on your server in your uh, organization. The cost for implement implementation is going to be very low. Um, a lot of these uh, applications will allow you to upload the data very quickly, and in about five minutes, you are already generating reports. Sounds great, right? Um, but downside to that is obviously, well, they're not going to be um, that it's a customization issue as well. So you can upload your data, you can run reports, you can customize it to a certain extent, but it's not going to be quite as robust as something that you can put on your server. So if you don't have a clear, and also if you don't have a clear goal for what kind of reports you want to run, um, here data is just going to remain data. It doesn't become insight until you have identified what are the evaluation criteria that you want to, um, you want to look at. And privacy and security is another thing, too, is that when you upload, upload your data to these on-demand business intelligence uh, hosted services, your data is hosted with them. Um, it is not on your desktop. It is somewhere else in a server, which means you may or may not want to use it for, for potentially sensitive data. And as with everything, um, it can be difficult to implement well um, if you're not sure what kind of reporting you want to do and if you haven't really thought through the different kinds of data you need to collect. So uh, if you have the wrong data and even if you feed it into here and make some graphs out of it, it may not give you the insight that you're looking for. Uh, I will show you the popular ones. Um, BI on demand is uh, this one that is from SAP. Jaspersoft is um, a open source one that you can install on your server or um, you can have it hosted somewhere else. Crystal Reports is also from SAP. Now that one is not a hosted um, um, application. It is something that you would put on your web server and it works really, really well with your website. And I put Salesforce here is because Salesforce is known for their reporting abilities. Um, so if you have integrated Salesforce with uh, your other applications, you can pull that data into Salesforce and be able to generate very robust uh, reporting. So I'm going to show you um, business objects, uh, SAP business objects, BI on demand. It's interesting here, um, when you sign up, again, it is, uh, is, it's free for you to, guys to try. It's at bi.ondemand.com. Um, and if you, when you come here, you can uh, upload whatever data you want from your Excel spreadsheet. So all you have to do is say add new, add a data set. It will prompt you to upload in, in the format that's listed here. And once you have uploaded your um, your data, it will um, go through an analysis uh, stage with you and, um, and be able to show you some pretty interesting I'm going to have to quick click on the Explore button really quickly because I just realized there's organization information that we probably don't want everyone to see here. Um, but here, this is our sales data um, for the last month or so. We are, it automatically will be able to look at um, what are some of the things you, that you might be interested in, in, in seeing. Um, and you can compare data. You can select different things here. So if I want to um, look at, for example, by city, what, what cities are um, asking for the most amount of donations? Uh, right now, I've got Ottawa coming up as a front runner. They beat Toronto. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, and once you have these kind of data here, you can export it or create a visualization. And what that does is it creates these beautiful uh, charts, pie charts, bar charts, what have you, that can you, you can now either download or share um, or send to uh, collaborative uh, team management software like Streamworks, which we can cover a little bit later. Um, so so what that means is this is almost instantaneous ways for groups of people to be able to come together and look at um, how they're doing. So you, you can have your marketing team and your fundraising team be able to look, see how um, you have launched the latest um, campaign and where that's at. And then you can embed this, um, and I apologize for the error that you're seeing on screen for that. 
uh, chart. But you can embed this chart now on your website in real time. So that's real information, real time that you can now put onto your site or send to, say, your funders uh, or your stakeholders. Um, you can generate a volunteer report and be able to share that with your volunteers. So they can potentially see how they're doing and how much time they have put in. And really the potential here is limit limitless. Uh, provided that you implement it the proper way for your organization. So I talked a little bit about the you know, ability of um, sharing your reports in on-demand to Streamworks. So what the trend right now is too isn't just about us producing some piece of information on our site anymore or on our desktop. Um, more and more we're realizing that we're more powerful as a group um, and the uh, there's this desire to, to collaborate and look at ways that we can work with each other a lot more efficient. Uh, so teleconferencing software a lot, or webinars um, such as this one or web meetings allow you to be able to speak to each other and break down that geographical barrier. Um, having meetings online or being able to collaborate online will reduce the amount of time you probably spend traveling to places uh, to face-to-face -face meetings. And real-time documentation of project development, too, allow you to be able to, instead of trying to design a project and be able to, and having to come up with the documentation of how you actually uh, produced your project, uh, as, as you document um, your collaborative process, you are now producing that documentation um, on the go. So afterwards, there's less time that you need to spend thinking about, okay, wait, how did I actually design the campaign? How, how did I actually launch it? What are all the steps that I, I went through? Um, so a lot of these new collaborative software will allow you the ability to make those documentation um, as you're going through the projects. And I know we all send around these emails to each other when we are drafting documents or when we're trying to think of a meeting time. Um, collaborative software these days allow us to be able to reduce the number of emails and reduce the number of drafts um, and documents that we have to go through. So uh, what are the ways that you can work together a lot more efficiently without tying up our, our inbox? And of course, with collaborative um, applications and software, there are drawbacks as well. Um, many times, a lot of the staff will say that the, there's a requirement for training. So um, even with the slide rocket that we're using, it's interesting. It allows us to be able to share our slides with each other and do all these great things with it. But there's a learning curve to it. Uh, when we try to um, uh, use our webinar today, just going to go to meeting and try to uh, think about all the steps required a lot of time and, the, and thinking through the process. Um, making sure that we have the proper internet access so that we can deliver these webinars. Um, so people can access it online and making sure that we have the proper voice, quality. These are all things that we have to think about and could potentially be a real cost as well. And of course, um, when we talk about online collaboration, it's not a replacement face to, for face-to-face -face interaction. You guys can't see me talking right now. I'd much rather be able to see your faces and see if you're, if you're interested in what I'm say saying um, or if you're actually dozing off, if you're checking your emails. Um, when we work together, that sort of in-person thing, is. It is key, and online collaboration is a great way of being a supplement to it, but it will never be a replacement for it. Now, tools for collaboration. There are tons, and there's almost too many for us to even really talk about today. But GoToMeeting and GoToWebinar is a is a great um, web conferencing tool that I would recommend. Um, it is available through the TechSoup Canada Donations Program, and it is what we're using today to deliver the webinar to you. We feel that it is quite easy to use. Um, I will say, if you are a Mac user like I am, it is not the most friendly thing uh, for a presenter. Uh, for something like Skype, many of you probably already use that within your organization. It allows you to be able to um, chat with each other very easily, have video conferencing um, through the Skype premium option, um, as well um, being able to communicate with each other almost uh, in real time instantaneously. 
Dropbox and Box.net I've mentioned before, but I will show you really, really quickly what that means. It means that I can store all of my data online. So all the files that we use at TechSoup, we use Dropbox. And we, um, what I like about it is this traditional sort of folder um, system. So the three of us in the office, we can just dump our um, documents within the these folders. And as we update them, um, it is synced between our computers. So we don't we do never really have to worry about uh, making sure we have the right version of a particular draft. And you can um, store Word documents, you can store Excel spreadsheets, you can have video, you can have pictures. It is almost like having a file server um, virtually. And the Dropbox has a free version that allow you to have about two gigs of data. Um, I believe um, Box.net gives you more. I think it is five gigs. Another one that we've been using in conjunction with Google Apps is Smartsheet. And it is kind of um, what I would call almost like uh, spreadsheets on, on steroids. So what you're seeing right now is what we use as a process document to, um, to go through the, uh, the planning process for our webinar today. Um, and here it is shared between all of the staff. We can go in and look at all the roles that each one of us will need to do before we can actually de deliver a webinar and who's responsible for what. And I can change this in real time. So if I don't want to be the person um, to, to, to actually schedule the date and let's say I really want to make sure that it, this is something that Every time we do a webinar, I want Lori to do it. I could change it to Lori in real time. Press save, and when Lori goes to um, access this webinar from her browser, she can see that right away. And I can attach any uh, documents that I want to Smartsheet. So if I want to say, attach my presentation to this um, so that the two of the can them can review it ahead of time, I can do that. And I can also make comments and start a discussion here as well. So I could probably say something like, uh, we need to make sure um, Jane never gets to be a presenter. Um, oops, I can't type. Uh, that's why she can't be a presenter. Um, and the rest of the team can say, well, like, have a conversation. They can comment on here in real time. And so Smartsheet is something that we have really enjoyed working with in the past. And it does come with a lot of templates that you can use. So you can use something like Smartsheet uh, where people may be more comfortable using that sort of Excel look and feel um, to do, say, project management. And you can even track your status. How are we doing for, for this? Is it behind status so it's, it's red or are we on track? Uh, so it's very interesting and... Um, the cost is, is relatively low, um, but there is a cost to it. So it is a hosted application. It is a cloud application. OK, so let's move on to social really quickly. And I don't really want to spend the time here to talk about Facebook and Twitter, because I'm sure all of you have heard about Facebook and are probably on Twitter already or know what it is. The emergence here is with um, these swiggly thing that you probably see on it. Um, is looking at how do you integrate social with your other things that you're doing, your offline events, your existing communication channels like um, your direct mail or your email newsletter. Uh, QR codes is something I want to call out specifically. It is something that essentially is a way of generating a scannable picture for uh, someone with a smartphone. And you can um, embed anything you want in a QR code. And so what that means is someone with a smartphone can use their camera, take a picture of it, and be di taken directly to a URL or, or something that you have determined ahead of time. Um, right away. So you can embed videos, for example. Um, and what the, what's really great about this is in the past, what you do um, offline, so, so say your direct mail, is very, very different, um, maybe very different than what people see um, online. This way you can now in, encourage people to engage with you um, through both mediums. So if you're at an event and you have a poster up, what you could do is embed a video that is on your site. Um, in the QR code, and so people at the event may be like, well, what is this? They might be interested. They'll take a picture, and right away, they can watch that video on their phone at the event in real time. 
Um, or if you have a fundraising direct mail um, that you want to send out, but you feel that you know direct mail is is paper. There's only so much you can say. If you want to have a richer experience, instead of saying please go to www.techsoupcanada.ca, you can embed a, a, a QR code, and someone, um, probably someone with younger generation that have a smartphone, it's instantaneous. They can just pull out their phone. They don't even have to type in your URL. They can just snap that picture with a QR a code scanner, um, and be able to go to your site right away. And the benefits of these is that you are leveraging all the good things about social media. So you can still use social media as the hub of conversation. And um, and if you integrate it with, say, your CRMs and other tools, you can collect information and, and be able to look at how can you actually strengthen your messaging that you want to push out for your campaigns. And it will allow you to build a bigger and stronger bigger and stronger brand because now you're truly integrating uh, what you're doing online, offline, as well as conversations that's ha happening in the community. And it gives your organization a more of a personality. So it allows you to make that emotional connection with your community. Um, so by talking to them on Facebook and Twitter, because it's a lot more real time, it's short lived, you can, can get the capture of what's happening in that particular period of time. Uh, what are people saying about you at that time? So that's kind of the downside to it as well. And this is something that when you think about a longer term technology impact for your organization, Twitter and Facebook, um, they tend to get lost in the noise in many ways. So a lot of these things are very short lived, which is why you need to think about how you're integrating with the rest of your communication strategy. And how do you think about the overall impact that you want to generate? Do you want to use Twitter to push people to your site because that's the main interaction area that you want to use for your organization? Or do you want to use Twitter to push people to an event because that's how you engage with your community? So all of these things you'll probably need to think about. But the QR code is easy to do. Um, I'm going to gonna show you very, oh, maybe I don't have it. But if you search for QR code, uh, you will be able to see a lot of QR code generators out there that essentially you type in the URL. It will send you a snippet of a HTML that you can embed uh, on your website or um, it will send you the, the actual QR image so that you can just embed that in your direct mail. And in addition to that, um, here are some of the tools that you could use. Uh, TweetDeck is a really good one to track your social media conversations. Um, and here is an example of TweetDeck um, in Chrome. So I'm actually using a TweetDeck app within my web browser. And this is something I'm going to move on to is the ability of using um, web apps and mobile apps. Um, and that's another trend that's happening now is on your smartphones, you can install an app, which means uh, when you activate it, it's a light application that will um, instantaneously allow you to run a particular task. But more and more, there are things like web apps that's happening. So Chrome is an interesting web browser in that when you um, install Chrome, it probably looks something like this. And it'll have this web store, which means you can actually now go to the web store within Chrome and look at what apps you can, or light applications that you may want to install on your um, browser. So the browser is now becoming more and more like a, a desktop. So let's say I'm just going to show you uh, one in particular, um, I want something that will allow me to be able to write uh, or brainstorm something. Uh, so I don't really want any distractions. It's kind of a, like a word processing, processing software. Uh, I find it in the, uh, the web store. I can just install it. I don't need an IT person now to come and uh, do that for me. I don't need to put any floppies in my um, desktop. Um, and it's on my browser. And all I have to do is execute and I can I can now use it right away. Isn't that amazing? And that's sort of the, the trend uh, with these apps is it allows that instantaneous way of accessing these applications without having to deal with a lot of the traditional hassles of installing software. Of course, uh, you know me by now, the benefits and drawbacks. Well, be 
you don't need to install the software, which is great. You don't need to have the IT person to come in and say, you know, Jane, could you please come in and install this application for me so I can write? It's on demand. I can access it anywhere, which means I can be home on my computer. I can be um, using Tyranny's computer. I can use my mom's computer if I'm visiting her. And I will be able to access my apps and be able to access these programs and do my work essentially it doesn't matter where or it, it doesn't matter if I'm on a Mac or a PC so it's cross-platform but the downside to that is we're so early in the stages of app development um, I just showed you Writespace and I'm showing it to you for a reason when I first installed it I thought this is so wonderful I want to use this and I typed up a, a bunch of data and then I was like well how do I save this there isn't really an easy way for me to save I can't actually really save. Um, so in order for me to save what I've written on the screen, I have to actually navigate to a very weird place within my um, within my computer. That's where Chrome has actually stored the piece of information. And I still have to now and take that uh, where it saved it and import it to a traditional Word document. So there's a lot that still has to be done and I would say a lot of these apps are not quite mature yet for your day-to-day -day operations. And because anybody can make an app, there's that sort of app overload and we talked a little bit about there's almost too much out there, too many things to choose from. So when you go to a, a web uh, store for apps, it doesn't matter if it's for your smartphone or if it's for, for Chrome, what you're going to get is there's now instead of five things to choose from, there's 500, 5,000. I believe um, last time I checked an iPhone, I, I think there are 300,000 or something insanely crazy, a number of apps that I can install on my phone. And each one of them is just a little kind of program because it, it can't in, be this robust system on your browser. So the functionality is going to be thin and it is not really that in a replacement for enterprise software. So I'm going to show you the right space again. This is not a word replacement. It's not going to do columns for me. It's not going to be able to, I can't generate my annual report in this. So it, it has a long way to go uh, before it can actually replace my traditional word, uh, office application. And the cost of access to not all of these apps are free. So I showed you a smart sheet. There is a real cost per user per month to smart sheet. And I've only installed a few to show you, but can you imagine if I have about a hundred apps for a hundred different things on my browser? There is really no easy way for me to organize this right now. It's going to be chaotic. I'm going to have to pretty much be able to remember what app is for what and what the icon looks like and how am I going to actually execute it. So I would say there is still a long way to go. And the security piece too, again, you know, um, it is not hosted on my desktop. So, so that information that I just wrote um, in, in Brightspace, where is it actually? How can I make sure that it's, it's saved in a safe place? Um, or if I'm collaborating with my team in Smartsheet, what if Smartsheet is down for maintenance the day that we need to do a presentation to our stakeholders? And we have made sure that our reporting is um, in Smartsheet. So for the stakeholder, it might be really good for them to get access to this in real time, and they can download it um, in PDF format if they wanted to. But if this is not available to them because internet is not available or the host provider has decided to take it down for maintenance, then we're out of luck. So those are the things to to really think about. And I realize that um, we're probably running out of time. So I do want to give you uh, some ideas to into thinking about how do you make sure that these trends and tools are actually right for your organization. Um, the site that I highly recommend is called smartchart.org. And essentially, it helps you to chart out goals for your organization. Um, we talked a little bit about you know, if you don't have the right goals set, if you don't know what you're measuring, you can have the best sort of on-demand business intelligence software. It's not going to help you. If you don't know what you're trying to achieve, uh, what, what data you need to collect, you can have the best CRMs and you may be collecting the wrong data. Um, and SmartChart, what they do is actually take you through a whole planning process. And it is free for all nonprofit organizations.
So you can register with them at smartchart.org, and they take you through the whole process of um, thinking about your organization's mission, what are the, the things that you want to achieve, uh, your, and the strategies, and it's this literally step-by-step -step, um, process that you can go through with them. So we probably don't have time to actually show you the actual um, process today, but I would encourage you guys to register and, and go through it and look at um, how this tool can help you set your benchmarks, set it so that everything that you're measuring is actually attainable and is tangible. And for those of you that have come to our past events, um, this is probably a uh, diagram that you'll see um, quite often. We always talk about technology isn't a solution for an organization. In order, in order for technology to be deployed really well for an organization, other things need to be in place as well. So for us, it's really thinking about the people, the process, and the technology. Making sure that you have the right staff buy-in, that all levels of your organization are committed to using a particular technology, um, making sure that the right training is in place for these people, and making sure that you recruit the right staff as well, so the right tech-savvy staff that are not afraid to try new things, or uh, management that are open to experimenting, say, with different ways of using social media, um, and making sure the budget is there. And we talk about budget in all the different areas. It's not just budgeting for IT. Uh, the staff time that's needed to up grade uh, to try to upload content, to provide the content, to make sure that they are there to engage the community using social media. That's staff time that you need to budget as well. And it can't always just be a, a volunteer, because a volunteer may or may not understand what is core to your organization. So at the end of the day, you still need to have someone to um, either you know, supervise the volunteer or be the staff that is actually doing communications for your organization or doing the fundraising or using the technology for your organization. And the time commitment here from the staff is crucial. We're all sort of overworked and underpaid. So if you implement a technology system without thinking about how much time it is going to require for people to use it, that's more time that's out, out of your staff that they will need to take to use this technology. And if they don't see the benefits, um, if they don't see how it can grow the capacity of your organization, they will not use it. And that brings us to the process piece is technology really should be there to help you to simplify certain process that may be tedious and manual for you. And technology should be there to automate certain things that the staff may not enjoy doing. And by automating and simplifying certain process using technology, that helps you to increase the capacity of your organization because now you're saving time for your staff from having to do, say, your donor management manually with pen and paper or what I have shown you uh, using Smartsheet, saving time for having to draft, coming up with different drafts of a particular uh, spreadsheet, for example, and sending it around. Now we're collaborating in real time. That is increasing our capacity to do more with limited time. But in order to do that well, you will have to create a roadmap of your process. And then looking at how your organization is currently doing what you do. So how are people doing their tasks uh, every day? What are the areas that you can um, uh, simplify and then that's when the technology comes in and here you you know with cloud technology you do have to budget and you will have to think about scalability it is not really about what is free for you to start with today but what is going to be the lowest cost uh, solution for you three years from now five years from now in the open source and proprietary and cloud versus having in-house is how much control do you actually want to have over your technology obviously open source you have control of everything in-house you have control of everything but there are downsides to that it means you are on the hook for the maintenance you're on the hook for making sure the upgrades are being done properly having proprietary software cloud-based or or hosted application means they you are paying them to upgrade you're paying them to stay current and you're paying for that customer service um, so, but the cost is going to be it's a different kind of cost but there's a cost there as well in the data portability what is easy for you to start using in five minutes may not be easy for you to take your data out of it say six months from now when you have outgrown that particular application 
So if you're thinking about CRMs, don't just think about, okay, what do I need to, for today for my volunteer management? Because you don't want to spend, say, a week of your time entering, entering all of your volunteer management data, only to find out that that particular software that you, you're using is, does not integrate well with any of the other systems that you may be using within your organization. So now you are going to be stuck in that silo of you can only track your volunteer information with that particular software and when you have to move to a more robust volunteer management system you can't just export readily and it's going to be a very tedious and headachey migration process. So I know this is very fast and I know this is very high level so um, I will show you some of our past webinars that may be able to help you think through some of this. And again, it goes back to, you know, we, we learned a little bit about the current trends um, in technology, but how do you actually think about it? So we had a introduction to technology planning webinar. And for that one, um, I do encourage, if you haven't already, to check it out. We do have a checklist for you to think about that you can download and look at what are all the different aspects of technology that you need to think about in your organization. So not not just about social media, not just about, okay, would it be cool to have a webinar? What are all the different ways that we're using technology within our organizations? How do we go forward and plan? And there is a planning document that you can download. So for those of you that may have asked questions about Google Apps, how do I use Google Apps for my email? How do I use it to uh, Google Docs to, to collaborate? Um, we had a Google Apps 101 webinar as well, and there is a, um, a checklist there for you to think about as well. Um, all about CRM is the last one that we did. Here is an interesting one. CRM is a complicated area to think about and it requires a lot of your time to really map it out for your organization in order for you to implement it well. So if you go to that um, to the webinar section of our website. You can see um, the details for the All About CRMs webinar. And we also have a, um, a spreadsheet that you can download um, where you can use that as your worksheet to determine whether or not uh, which CRM is good for you and what, it, what are your, your, your needs for your organization. And of course, um, we're always here to uh, to answer any questions that you may have. So what I'm going to do right now, I know we've kind of went over the, the time that we had allotted for the webinar today, but if you're interested, I would like to maybe spend the next 15 minutes taking questions from the audience. And I do want to thank you guys very much uh, for coming to the webinar today. And I hope it's useful for you. We are going to be sending out a, a survey. Uh, so we would love to hear some feedback from you about today's session. I do understand it, it is very high level it is uh, probably a little bit too quick, but um, if there are areas that you got, you would like for us to develop something more in depth on, please let us know. Um, this is our way of kind of throwing a few pieces that out there for you to see which areas that you may be interested in, and we will produce a webinar on that particular particular area for you in the future. And if you have um, certain applications, I kind of show them really, really quickly. Now, if you are interested in having me show you um, live some of these applications, feel free to enter that into the chat box. Um, or if you're saying, okay, you know, you talked about certain areas, I didn't quite get it. Uh, could you, you know, explain it a little more? I'm more than happy to do that as well. Somebody asked about apps to manage Twitter, um, and they said, do you know of an app which would allow me to be locked into Twitter, um, to two Twitter accounts at once? Um, you have your personal account and you have a work account. Now, TweetDeck is really, really good for that. Um, good thing I have it actually here. So, you, as you can see, I have my personal account here, and I can, um, in TweetDeck, actually add more. So TechSoup Canada account. So as you can see, we've got both here. Um, so 
that is one application I would suggest for you to use. Uh, I like it because you can create columns based on searches that you have made. So if I'm at an event and I want to know what people are saying about that particular event, so I can search for the hashtag that they may have predefined for the event and create a column out of it. So I, then that gives me that real-time conversation that people are having um, on Twitter about the event. But then maybe at the same time, I want to say, well, what are people saying about TechSoup Canada? So I can, I can search TechSoup Canada or look at all the mentions that people may have had for TechSoup Canada and create a column for that as well. So it is very flexible in that it allows me to create multiple columns. It allows me to also um, create lists uh, as well. So if I want to track... Um, if I'm following, say, hundreds of people, it can be very overwhelming to try and remember who they all are. Uh, generating lists here allow me to really quickly categorize them into, okay, these are social service organizations that I'm following. These are organizations that are uh, dealing with youth, or here are bloggers that I really like because they blog about social media. So that allows me to very quickly categorize all of my all of the people that I'm following um, into different buckets and it allows me to sort through um, all of their tweets a lot easier. So it's not me wading through 2,000 tweets. Um, and then so I can focus on particular conversations and look at how I can be part of that conversation. Are there any other questions? Um, someone asked if there are any good resources to start with social media tips and, and uses. Um, I'm actually going to let um, Tyranny probably answer this one for you a little bit as well. Um, yes, there are lots of them and they, one of the um, the blog, the one blog that I would definitely for you to recommend for you to go to um, is Beth Cantor's blog. Um, she is she blogs about social media used by nonprofits, uh, and I love the way she explains everything in very simple um, English. And she does this very uh, good way of actually testing out uh, the different methodologies herself, and then coming up with a, a best practices and putting them into one very easy to read article for us online. Um, I think Tyranny would probably uh, also agree that um, Amy Semple Ward is, a, a, she's with N10 now, but she's also a wonderful blogger and she spoke at my Charity Connect very, uh, not too long ago, a few weeks ago. And you can access her uh, presentation from the My Charity Connect uh, website through Canada Helps. Um, she talked a lot about the tips and use and best practices. So her presentation is very, very good. I would also suggest that as a starting point for you to think about uh, when you're thinking about social media and some of the tools that you may want to use. Um, in fact, the whole My Charity Connect um, website is full of lots of great presentations from a lot of great presenters. Um, so you could probably go through them and look at what uh, might be useful for you. Idealware is another good one. Uh, what I like about Idealware is it isn't so much, um, their approach is to evaluate good, good applications and good, good tools out there. So they take more of a, a research approach. And their website is www.idealware.org. And what they do is if you look at, say, CRMs, they will actually go out and test a lot of different CRMs and say, OK, if you're a small organization and you have limited budget, this is what we recommend for you. If you're a larger organization and you need a more robust system, this is what we recommend. Here are the um, type of software that, you know, application that is great for, say, fundraising. Um, and or here's another one that is good it's kind of like a one application for all type of solution. So Idealware gives you a very digestible way of looking at particular areas and particular groups of application that you might be thinking about for your organization. And Amy Sample Word's uh, website um, is uh, in the chat box there. It's amysampleword.org. Okay, so um, are there any other questions? 
And uh, if you want to and you have a smartphone in front of you, um, and you can see this uh, QR code on my screen, if you have the Google Apps, um, the Google app, app on your phone, um, Google Goggles is what I'm using to scan things. Uh, what I do is uh, you can use your smartphone and take a picture using the Google Apps um, thing with, with a QR code and it will actually take you uh, to our website. So if you can do that, I, I highly recommend you to try it and it's very, very easy to do and it's, it's kind of fun. If there are no other questions, I want to thank all of you very much for um, coming, attending our webinar today. And uh, we'd love to hear what kind of webinars you want us to put on in the future. So um, look for that survey that we're going to be sending out to you after this event. And any feedback that you want to give us would be greatly appreciated. So thank you guys so much. Uh, we are going to be ending this webinar now and I look forward to speaking with you guys again in the future.